Let's get it on. Story time. I can't believe this is happening here. It's horrible! Oh, thank you, dude. My manager is here. Talk to me, Krabs. It started out as a simple order. A Krabby Patty with cheese. So what went wrong? When the customer took a bite. No cheese! Ah, oh, this has never happened before! Get a hold of yourself, Eugene. I'm going in. The Alpha Sponge. We're mad! Never fear, good citizens of Bikini Bottom. The manager is here. A real man named SpongeBob SquarePants heads off to the Krusty Krab as the manager of the Krusty Krab. SpongeBob scares a coward customer in the Krusty Krab named Phil. All SpongeBob had to do was add cheese to the sandwich. Nice and dramatic. Soon after, SpongeBob woke up from his dream and got ready for work, only to find out he wasn't promoted as manager like he expected. Because apparently he's just a kid. Aww. SpongeBob got depressed because of how much work he puts into his job. He decided to soak his depression in ice cream at the local Goofy Goobers and got drunk with Patrick. Hey. Hey, buddy. Come on. Wake up. Huh? Where am I? Really, nigga? Patrick searches for Spongebob at the Goofy Goobers. We fight Slammers and Foggers to our heart's content. After walking on ice cream and fighting a bunch of enemies, Patrick eventually catches up to Spongebob. Spongebob realized he was late for work. At the Krusty Krab, King Neptune confronted Mr. Krabs for his alleged thievery of Neptune's crown. Spongebob vouched for Mr. Krabs' character once he arrived, not to defend him, but to accuse him of being a horrible person. So Neptune freezes Mr. Krabs and Spongebob then sobers up quickly and volunteers to journey to Shell City and retrieve the King's crown within six days. Patrick agrees to join him on his journey, so Spongebob and Patrick decide to get into the pimped up paddy wagon and head off to begin their journey. While everyone was gone from the Krusty Krab, Plankton came in to steal the secret formula so he could sell Krabby Patties at the Chum Bucket. And with every purchase, customers will receive a mind-controlling bucket helmet. Plankton basically made everyone into slaves in his army. Squidward caught up to the news and failed to save the day, so he then became a slave too. Spongebob and Patrick in the meantime were cruising for a bruising. They stopped at a gas station just to get roasted by the charming locals. They said that our heroes wouldn't last long outside the city. I bet. So after trying to prove them wrong, Spongebob and Patrick were carjacked and then stranded at a vast desert, with only their feet for transportation. Mindy has Spongebob destroy radio towers Plankton had over the desert, basically to advertise the chumbuck and talk shit about us like Donald Trump. Not only him, but the locals were talking shit again too. Spongebob and Patrick then went on the slide to destroy more radio towers. This is where the game really picks up. I didn't do that. Looks like fireworks. Bust. Smash. Spongebob and Patrick slide in the bathtub like the savages they are, breaking through anything that stands in their way. Soon after they ran into the Thug Tug bar, which is where the paddy wagon was parked outside of. The only option they had was to go inside the bar and look for the key. In this case it meant chasing it down throughout the whole bar. We experienced a little disco fever and even crossed lava. Eventually we got the key back at the start. Spongebob and Patrick once again had access to the paddy wagon, but in the game here we had to collect keys to unlock the gate. After doing that, there was more trouble ahead. They stop by a suspicious graveyard to get some ice cream. The old lady is actually the tongue of a frogfish. It grabs Spongebob and Patrick has to save him. We stand up to the frogfish and beat his ass. We're in this together. From there, Spongebob and Patrick come across a trench, but they were too fearful to face it. Mindy gives Spongebob and Patrick fake mustaches to trick them into thinking they've become men. This gave Spongebob and Patrick fake confidence, also known as arrogance. We have to race to the bottom of the trench and we can get there fast by traveling down this slide past those sea monsters. After making it to the bottom, we traveled with Spongebob to cross this trench filled with horrible, hideous, and disgusting monsters. He likes me! We start to make even more progress as Patrick comes across a junkyard and destroys TVs filled with more Plankton commercials. He takes bad marketing to a whole new level. My name is Plankton. Come and eat at the Chum Bucket. Every fucking day, you come down and we'll stuff your face full of shit. <laughs> 
So the gruff and intimidating assassin Plankton Scent finally catches up to them. We fight him until the Cyclops crushes him. Yay! SpongeBob and Patrick were then taken by the Cyclops, but they find themselves wasting their time dreaming in the meantime. They're dreaming about driving in Gooberland, chasing the Goofy Goober and trying not to lose him. Nice, but they soon wake up in Shell City, which turns out to be nothing more than a gift shop filled with googly eyes and smelly knickknacks. The two idiots grab King Neptune's crown and slide their way out of that gay ass gift shop. I must say I do enjoy the scenery though. We slide out the window and bump into the hairy David Hasselhoff on the beach. David activates his jet engines and takes them back to the ocean. However, Dennis returns. He gets his ass kicked one final time on David's hairy ass back. By the time our heroes returned to Bikini Bottom, it was already transformed into Planktopolis. You have to be really manly to make it through this baby. Nothing but modern day slavery. We destroy a bunch of Plankton statues in a badass Egyptian level and catch our boy Plankton in the cut. He can't run forever. We re-retrieve the paddy wagon and drive to the Krusty Krab in a hurry to make it back in time, to avoid the falling debris. So here we are, the final battle. SpongeBob stands up to the protozoan coward, who sends his biggest minion after him. SpongeBob fights the king of the sea in an effort to destroy that hideous bucket helmet. After taking away half his health, he switches up on us and the Goofy Goober music starts playing. I can't play it because of copyright. Neptune is one persistent final boss, I'll give him that. We take care of him shortly enough. So that was the story of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie game. A lot of extra content was added since this is a video game, but we'll get into more of that later. The game has that heavy iron swag we know and love. Come on y'all, let's go play some fucking SpongeBob. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie game is a linear 3D platformer with refined Battle for Bikini Bottom style gameplay. Now a game like this wouldn't be much without its collectibles. In this game we collect manliness points, Krabby Patties, treasure chests, and Goofy Goober tokens. Manliness points are these weights you use to upgrade your abilities. The heavier the weight, the more manliness points it's worth. You get manliness points either by finding them scattered throughout levels, breaking through crates, or defeating enemies. When you collect a lot of them, the game stops you from boosting by giving you less and less in earlier levels or the current level you're on. This fixes an issue in Battle for Bikini Bottom where it was too easy to boost for shiny objects. Krabby Patties are used as health instead of underwear this time around. Treasure chests can be found in hidden areas to unlock neat extras in the pause menu. They're well hidden, but we'll get further into that later. And finally, Goofy Goober tokens are used to progress through levels or to teleport to previous levels using challenges you either completed or attempted. When you beat King Neptune after collecting all Goofy Goober tokens, you unlock a secret cutscene at the end of the game, just like in Battle for Bikini Bottom when you collect all the golden spatulas. This is clearly a linear collectathon, but what about the level design? The levels here are all related to the movie in some way. There are 18 of them, and many of them have names based off quotes from the movie. Some are platforming levels, some are paddy wagon levels, and some are sliding levels. Personally, I love the platforming levels and absolutely adore the sliding stages. Things like sliding in a bathtub, a shell, or even Neptune's crown is a great touch. The game has options to unlock some more Goofy Goober tokens and to add variety to the gameplay. You either go to panels to teleport to them or you just find some. We have some additions to the game like the Spongeball Arena where you have to make it to the very end of a path without falling off, the floating block challenges where your platforming skills are tested within an allotted time, or my favorite, the combat arena challenges where you have to fight off a whole bunch of enemies without dying. These often contain enemies you'll meet in future levels. They get tougher each time, until Heavy Iron trolls us. And once again, the game isn't going to let you boost here. Every enemy will only be worth one manliness point here so it won't be too easy. What, you thought this game was gonna hold your hand? Please, go play Hero Pants, you snowflake. Yeah, don't be such a wimp. You can do bungee jumping, sonic wave guitar challenges, freeze fruit challenges, and much more depending on the level, and if you can find them. Here's a classic. You can do time trials and ring challenges on the sliding and driving stages. These challenges show up when you teleport back to them after completing them. You basically start off with a normal time trial, then they give you a ring challenge, where you have to go through every ring throughout the entire level, and if you miss one, you have to start over. 
This is then preceded by the manly time challenge, which gives you less time to make it to the end. Only the manliness of men can complete them. Little guy, big stink. Combat. Both characters start off with standard spin attacks and then unlock more moves in each of their levels. SpongeBob gets the bass, sponge ball, and a sonic wave guitar in the later. <laughs> Patrick unlocks the cartwheel, smash, and throw. The upgrades are what make you feel more macho. You start off with three Krabby Patties for health, but you can unlock up to six for each character. SpongeBob can make his karate gloves more powerful and reflect enemy projectiles. And let me tell you, it's amazing. You can go from a boxing glove to a steel glove. Both of these are from I'm Your Biggest Fanatic. They detonate either manually or automatically after a few seconds. Instead of bowling a basic yellow ball, you can upgrade to this bad boy. Yes. Bro, it even electrocutes nearby enemies. That shit is fire. And why use a basic guitar for a sonic wave when you could bring out the Goofy Goober guitar? Patrick's spin upgrade is the same concept. The Macho Cartwheel basically just gets stronger. The Macho Ass Smash allows you to stud enemies so you can pick them up with the throw. And the Macho Throw, man is that powerful. But we can't talk about the combat without bringing up the enemies. Besides the jellyfish and some of the earlier enemies, the enemies are all Plankton's Buckethead minions. Yeah. Well, the most of the game are Plankton's Buckethead minions, excuse me. All the enemies change their design over time depending on the level and we're introduced to a new enemy in every platformer level. The tougher the enemy, the more manliness points we get, until we earn too much, like I said earlier. The enemies tend to get faster and more powerful in later levels. We have critters, foggers, slammers, slingers, spinners, flingers, poppers, mini merv, and merv. Wow, those names though. <laughs> When you're fighting these enemies, you have to time your attacks. You have to pick certain moves, and you have to play smarter and not harder. Most of my deaths are from knockback, but it's okay because you know our boy Han still has our back. But y'all be sleeping on the extras. There are 42 treasure chests to collect, okay? And each one you get gives you these neat bonus features. First, we have a few trailers for the SpongeBob movie. That's pretty cool. Next, we have costumes. SpongeBob and Patrick both have unlockable costumes based on the show. Spongebob has a Mermaid Man outfit. I love this outfit because of how confident Spongebob acts while he's wearing it. Patrick has a Disco Star outfit with a jellyfish on the back. Love the design. Patrick has a naked costume too, so basically you can run around streaking. Wow, that's funny. Spongebob's last unlockable costume is plain Sponge Spongebob. Now when I first read this, I thought it meant Spongebob was just going to be naked, but it actually meant the realistic sponge from the show. I can't believe Harry Iron made this a costume in the game. It's so cool to run around like this, man. But that's not all. There's more you can unlock using a few cheat codes. One of them is a sponge guard costume from the episode, uh. There's also a Patar one. Cool. But there's one last costume cheat code, and that's a SpongeBob ripped pants outfit. It even has SpongeBob with the white stuff on his nose from SpongeGuard on duty. The costumes are a welcome addition to this game. Anyways, there are sound packs you can unlock in the extra section too. It's awesome. Goofy, goofy, goober, goober, yeah! Maybe we shouldn't have stopped to spend our gift certificate to Dean's International Shop of Dried Fish Flakes and Flowers. Citizens of Planktopolis are to report any sightings of a big pink idiot and a square yellow knucklehead McSpazitron immediately. All sorts of things to waste your valuable time playing with. Heavy Iron also threw in some concept art. Looking at this today makes me really appreciate the effort they put into this game. The concept art is very creative and very detailed. The rest of the extras are just neat little features like tiny foggers, replacing Hans's hand with a pirate hook, changing the targeting hand, faster pickup radius, you know, neat little gizmos like that. This is something that makes you want to play the game more after beating it. The best version of this game is by far the Xbox version. It runs at the smoothest frame rate and has the best graphics and textures. It's so clean. It takes advantage of the more powerful Xbox hardware and man is it gorgeous. It even has crop widescreen support. The game itself has plenty of attention to detail alone. Heavy Iron uses stills from the show on floating block and sponge ball challenges. Heavy Iron has a license plate with their name on it in Shell City Dead Ahead. Hell, there's even a list of Heavy Iron's best times for the paddy wagon and sliding levels hidden in the Planktopolis level. I like the feeling of this game. It's like an expansion of Battle for Bikini Bottom, and I'm cool with that. Wait for it.
The music in the SpongeBob movie game is awesome. The soundtrack fits the theme each level is trying to portray and it has the same energetic vibe as the movie, except it's better. For example, the tutorial level starts off with badass James Bond spy music and the Goofy Goobers music gives off vibes of being drunk. Some music I feel is generic like the Frogfish boss music or the Dennis boss fight music, but then we have straight fire like the Thug Tug music, slide music and the epic final boss music. Shell City Dead Ahead's music is dark and dank. Makes me feel like I'm in a junkyard filled with Hero Pants copies, you know what I'm saying? Everyone will have different opinions on their favorite tracks, but most of the music in this game is dope and memorable. From my experience, every time I play the slide music out loud, most people love it, even if they don't know where it's from. The game's soundtrack can get you hyped. It's catchy and uplifting. Every time I listen to the music, it makes me want to boot up the game and fuck shit up. The music isn't just Spongebob music, it's video game music. It's movie game music. I can't listen to this without getting excited. Buddy, you're doing fine. Ah! I won't let you blow. You're pissing me off. <laughs> Come on, Patrick. It's so much nicer with a bucket helmet. <laughs> All right, boys and girls. Time for some fair, constructive criticism. I'll give it to y'all straight. The main story cutscenes are just screenshots from the movie, along with stock images and renders being commentated over by the French narrator. Viacom wasn't gonna let Heavy Iron use footage from the movie, and Nickelodeon didn't give them enough time to recreate everything in 3D. David Hasselhoff's name isn't even allowed to be used in this game. I didn't ride that for nothing. What's that? Also, here's an important point of reference for you Nintendo users out there. The GameCube port of this game is terrible. Basically all the paddy wagon levels along with Bubble Boy and Baby Hunt and the last sliding level run in 30 FPS on GameCube. The game was made to run in 60 FPS so this basically makes all those levels play horribly and it makes the game inconsistent. No, it doesn't end at the frame rate, believe me, I am not petty. Some attention to detail had to be removed too. If you look at the citizens in the first level standing in the background, they aren't animated at all in the GameCube version. The animations were completely removed. They're just standing there completely idle. On the Xbox and PS2 versions, they do sway back and forth as you can see here. But the, the main point I'm trying to make here is everything on the GameCube version looks worse because of the compression. It's a real shame because this is a very good looking game for its time, especially on Xbox. Every little detail is worse on GameCube, just every little detail. As much as I like the variety in this game, especially when it's related to the film and they try to be creative, it will turn some people off. You have to backtrack and select challenges to do or else you won't be able to get enough Goofy Goober tokens from Mindy. What are you staring at, Patrick? You'll still need more Goofy Goober tokens before you can learn to pick up and throw. <laughs> Being forced to go to previous levels can get annoying if you really don't want to do it. The ring challenges piss off a lot of people too. For some people, the moment they start having fun, the game will tell you to fuck off and go back. The game gives you 68 options for Goofy Goober tokens when you only need 50 to get the paddy wagon back, so it's not like you're forced to do every challenge in the game, but the system itself is still flawed and unfair. It's basically punishing you if you don't pay as much attention as they want you to. It's like Battle for Bikini Bottom, but it's way more obnoxious, mostly due to this game having less freedom. Personally, I think the paddy wagon levels are annoying. I often wish I could just skip them. The paddy wagon is very slippery and sluggish, by far the least fun levels in the entire game. I'm not gonna lie, I do wish there were more platforming levels to play, but that would fuck up the game's formula to be like the movie. Well, what can you do? It's a movie game. Another issue would be the voice acting. You can tell from the cutscenes that it's rushed. Yes, the game is very old, so I'll cut it some slack, but the pacing and I'll let you pet Mr. Whiskers is too fast. You can really notice it if you pay attention. It doesn't have a natural flow because it's missing polish. You also have the fact that some voice actors didn't make it to the game. But the Dennis and King Neptune replacements are very decent. And hey, at least we have Clancy Brown as Mr. Krabs this time. So yeah, as a movie game made in under a year compared to the two years Battle for Bikini Bottom had, this game has its quirks. Obviously, there are going to be some issues. Regardless of how much I enjoy this game, I acknowledge them. Most of the issues in this game are pretty small though, like how ledge grabbing doesn't work sometimes with floating block challenges. 
how SpongeBob's sneaking mechanic is cosmetic and has no use at all, how warping the challenges takes you to the challenge instead of the panel, or how sometimes you have to wait for platforms. Oh, boo-hoo! Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. Nitpicking, guys. Little issues. I'm not going to be Petty Roosevelt about it. This is a fun game, but don't pretend it's a top-of-the-line masterpiece. That's all I'm saying. Well, maybe we shouldn't have stopped at that roadside rutabaga stand. So that leads up to the final question. Is this game worth it? To most SpongeBob game fans, yes. The SpongeBob movie game feels exactly like the movie it's based off of and can give you a great epic feeling of adventure. It challenges both kids and adults, and that's why when I was a kid I knew adults that loved to play this game too. None of the game's small problems really stopped me from liking the game. I pretty much have a take it or leave it kind of attitude with this game. I can pick it up and play it for hours. It gets me hyped. Battle for Bikini Bottom doesn't have cool costumes to wear or an upgrade system. The movie game just adds more content outside the core gameplay. There is a good reason for this game to exist. It's like a second option, so even if you don't like the game, you have to acknowledge this shit, man. This isn't a sequel to Battle for Bikini Bottom. It's just a spiritual successor released a year later. Don't get it twisted, people. But even though I like the movie game, I don't think it's the best SpongeBob game ever made. There are some people that do, but objectively, I don't see it that way. It becomes mediocre for people that take the small issues more seriously, but it's awesome for those who don't. It's up to you to determine if the game's minor issues are bad enough to stop you from having a good time. Regardless, I perceive this game as a fun 3D platformer that I would recommend to anyone with a similar mindset. The back of the box doesn't say full AAA platformer for nothing. It's no surprise that this game was re-released twice. It sold well, a lot of people love it. This is a Spongebob game that doesn't hold your hand like you're a helpless child. It gives you a good challenge and I respect that. That's right, real men like a challenge. True. The movie game isn't a bad game. It's a good game with flaws because of its limitations in development. The final product is still one of the best movie tie-in games ever made. Even if you don't like the game, you can't just discredit other people's experiences. You'd be no better than Fred Fauno 7 in his robotic revenge review. That guy's such an asshole. I heard he was reviewing the movie game though. Now this is the first time I've done this, but I'm gonna rate each version. For the Xbox version, I give this game an 8 out of 10 with 68 Goofy Goober tokens. It's the juggernaut. Consistent frame rate, pretty graphics, how much could you ask for? It's just too manly. Y'all know what it is, no weenies allowed. For the PS2 version, I give this game a 7 out of 10 with King Neptune's crown because this version is the king in terms of sales, but it will never be as pretty and consistent as the Xbox version. For the GameCube version, I give this game a 4 out of 10 with a Spongebob GameCube controller that has a broken nose to match the quality of this shitty port. Okie dokie! Great on Xbox, good on PS2, and below average on GameCube. There you go. Bottom line is, if you hate artificial lengthening or you just don't give a fuck about any of the many positives I brought up, Hey, it's okay, just don't buy the game. But if you're up for a little challenge, want to turn up to this game like me, or if you're just a stupid nostalgia fag, get off your lazy ass and pick up this game. You can easily find a used copy on eBay or Amazon for a cheap price. Go for it, join the party. But remember, no weenies allowed. Well, I better get going. I forgot to pull out Mindy is Pregnant. This has been a Fred Review and I'll see you next time. Fucking day.